Let's talk about seven of the best army lists in Warhammer 40k right now. Hello and welcome back to Warspets Tactics where today we're talking 40k army lists and in this video I thought we'd do a roundup of some of the strongest army lists in the game currently with a look at seven of the very best army lists in the game. For this one I thought it could be interesting to zero in a few of the army lists that didn't just win tournaments but enormous tournaments so for this one I looked at only events that had around about 100 players or more and the size of these incredibly big events means that if you're going to make it to the top of it you absolutely need to have an optimised army list that's had a good amount of thought put into it and obviously it goes without saying that you need to be a great tabletop general. I feel like after several passes of Games Workshop's balance in 10th edition Player skill is more important than exact choice of faction, though admittedly some armies do tend to do better than others, and of course there's massively more optimised or de-optimised builds within those armies. In any case, let's talk through seven of the very best, all armies that have seen off a ridiculous amount of competition, and a maximum of one army list per faction. Though with 10th edition balance as it is, it wasn't really too hard to find examples of a lot of different armies doing well. First off, I thought we'd start with one of the biggest and most recent events out there. It seems that Derek Apshi of 40k Dirtbags, whose YouTube channel I'll link down in the video description, is still at it with the Chaos Colts, placing first at Nova, going 9-0 against a field of 360 players, with his very unorthodox and interesting Chaos board control list, with a detachment that was dismissed by most as being outright weak when the Chaos Codex dropped. Chaos Marines in general have a kind of low win rate right now, though they're still topping lots of tournaments, with this and things like Renegade Raiders and Pack Bound. Chaos Cult as a detachment is the one that boosts all the damned units, giving them access to desperate packs, a chance to make a further dark pact and have the chance to take more damage for a plus two to movement and a plus two to charge range. And between a massive amount of cultists, traitor guardsmen and accursed cultists, it's a very scary board control army where the enemy won't be able to deal with the waves of chaff fast enough to stop them winning the game on scoring. But they also very much can't afford to be too aggressive either, as the big blobs of accursed cultists with the buffs from this detachment and attached dark communes and things can outright down very, very scary enemy threats. Going through the army list, there's three units of 16 accursed cultists, fairly tough hordes who have their hidden torment models in there that strike with a whole bunch of essentially heavy bolter style attack with lethal hits if necessary, and they're incredibly tricky to engage on midfield objectives given that they've got that surge move going on where they take fire. In this one, two of them are led by dark communes, one of which can still scout, and they give them the 5 plus invulnerable save, and big once per game speed and damage boost. One's led by a dark apostle that can respawn damn models, so it means that you could have D3 torments coming back, which is pretty big. And then the detachment has got some pretty powerful stratagems like reroll wound rolls in melee advance and charge whenever you need it, or boosting strength and Then to go alongside that, there's six units of cultists with their sticky objectives, and just a whole bunch of screening chaff that won't do much besides light infantry, but in this detachment can move very quickly. Six sets of traitor guard who can get some cover on objectives, and can take down a few medium infantry with special weapon fire. Cypher's about to again wail on some medium infantry as well as do lone operative tricks, and Fabius Bile apparently joins a unit of cultists most of the time piling into a rhino as an annoying threat that makes them oddly threatening for their cost and could maybe be another interesting unit for stratagems and things. Then there's quite a lot of demon support, three nerglings for some infiltrate screening and I guess they'd guarantee that you can get some scout moves off, a unit of blisteringly fast seekers that could maybe do move block screening things on the first turn to keep the enemy penned back for one extra crucial turn, some demonettes to unlock the seekers and have a little bit of a threat in melee, and one beast of Nurgle, which apparently very much made itself useful as an annoying deep striker that can pin back to full health if the enemy can't focus it. Overall, it's a very cool army. They just look kind of horrendous to deal with, with so many frustrating units that you can't really get your teeth into. It'd be very hard to stop them scoring things fast enough, and the accursed cultists are all going to be a problem unit to deal with, whether you're trying to shoot them down and they're surging forward, or engage them in melee. Before we move on to some more scary army list goodness, I'm just going to give a quick shout out to Titans Terrain who reached out to ask to sponsor today's video. Generally quite a well received terrain set that could be of interest to some people. The idea is that they have a sort of tile grid system that folds out and has pop up buildings made of card, meaning that you can basically have an entire board worth of 40k terrain that lives in a box around about the same size as a standard board game. There are pros and cons to it versus the other types of terrain systems that you can get out there, whether it's MDF, plastic or 3D printed stuff, but in general it's been fairly well received and had a pretty good response when I featured it previously on the channel. Feel free to check them out, linked in the video description if you're interested. I'll cycle back to this at the end of the video to take a closer look at a few of their specific offerings and a few of the pros and cons versus other things. In any case, a big thank you for sponsoring this one. 
Back to the scary 40k list though, and next up, perhaps to no one's major surprise, is the Adeptus Auroritus with the Bringers of Flame. At the moment they do seem to be the single most successful army on the tournament scene, taking home a massive amount of trophies including multiple big events, and this list was a recent one by an Alvaro Perez who used it to take first as a tournament called La Vos de Horus Open, a big event of over 100 players. The Bringers of Flame is the Move Fast and Shoot Hard Sisters detachment, the assault keyword on everything to help get all that scary Melter and Flamer damage in range, and then plus one strength when you get within 12 inches. On top of that, some nice damage dealer stratagems, including a scary devastating wound torrent one, and having an armor of contempt equivalent really isn't the worst as well, particularly for Paragon Warsuits. Talking of which, there's more than Val and three Paragon Warsuits here, the Paragons taking Warblades and Multi-Melters, and basically they're an army that, if left unchecked, will be able to just destroy things like entire enemy tank columns in a single turn. Plus one to hit and wound against vehicles is scary, and more than Val gives them four rerolls to hit and wound against everything. They've just got ridiculous damage against virtually everything. Their main weakness is that they're just not really all that tough for the cost, so they need to either play smart with terrain or use something like Rapid Ingress to get them there. Next there's the Triumph of St. Catherine, which is basically auto-include for most sisters, an automatic 6 miracle dice. It's a ridiculously big boon, and you can plug that in to automatic damage results, or big charges, or whatever else you need. Plus, basically all of its auras can be useful, particularly the movement boosting one, which can have things like the emulators and other units speeding across the board to get to grips with the enemy. For characters and squads, there's a Battle Sister squad, two sets of 10 Dominions, one with Flamers and one with Melter Guns, and then to lead them there's a Karaness with the Iron Surplus, the Palatine with Righteous Rage, and three Dialogus, one with Fire and Fury. Always a little bit hard to determine from the list alone exactly what attaches to what, I kind of feel like all three of those units would quite enjoy being split in half by the Immolators, and the Immolators would enjoy the Dominion Scout moves, so it could be one Melter Gun and one Flamer Dominion unit, and the Battle Sisters blocked up, though I'm not 100% sure from this, Looks like two of the Dialogues might run solo, as nice little 30 point units either for screening or doing secondaries. The one with Fire and Fury can either give you sustained hits or plus one to attacks, so that one would be nice as a buffing unit either for the Melter Gun Dominions or the Battle Sister Squad. The Canoness can do some nice free stratagems, and it's unusually tanky with the Iron Surplus for 5 points, and the Power Time with Righteous Rage is a good melee combat unit, plus it brings lethal hits as well, could be interesting in one of the Melter units. Otherwise, there's two really big scary squads of Seraphim with hand flamers. They've got fairly terrifying damage output with that many strength 5 auto hits in this detachment, though they can also use that torrent stratagem for a whole bunch of devastating wounds. It's not quite as crazy as if they have the Canoness leading them, but that's still a good chance for around about 5 devastating wounds for a squad, never mind anything that they do with the normal wound rolls. Finally, there's two Castigators, really nice volume fire with Ignore's Cover Battle Cannons, and they can also add a bit of extra AP on one unit, particularly nice for anything that's been targeted by Flamers to get some AP on them. Overall, pretty scary stuff here. Just so many units that can deal crazy damage to just about anything, and all of it moving really quite quickly as well. Next up, we've got a Force of the Unforgiven with the Dark Angels Gladius Task Force. This one was run by Cam Hawkins, using it to take first at Texas Open 2024, going 6 wins to no losses at an event of over 100 players. Dark Angels Gladius does seem to be racking up a bunch of tournament wins, despite the faction maybe being a little bit more mediocre on the win rate stats overall. Basically, anyone using the Core Codex attachment just seems to be at a big disadvantage at the moment. Gladius is kind of great for the advance and charge it can get for things like Inner Circle Companions or Deathwing Knights, a nice melee damage dealer stratagem, and a scary fire discipline combo, in evidence here with an apothecary biologist with fire discipline on a big unit of eradicators, or hiding out in a repulsor to deliver them to combat. They should pretty much guarantee any one heavy target just eats a bunch of melter fire and blows up, and definitely still a big threat to any heavy infantry out there as well. For Dark Angel's unique stuff though, we've got Grandmaster Azrael himself. I guess he's going to be running with one set of Inner Circle Companions, and the Judas here is going to be going with the other set. Azrael does synergize with them all very nicely, a 4 plus invulnerable save, and sustained hits to go with their lethal hits. It looks like both of those units are going to be riding in impulses with a missile array, which maybe is just a little bit at odds with Azrael's ability as he can't farm command points when he's in there. Inner Circle Companions can put out a crazy amount of damage though, now they've got their boost in melee profile. The other squad of them takes a Judas here, so they can be fighting first if anything tries to charge them, plus they're a pretty scary unit for heroic intervention. Then there's two units of five Deathwing Knights, 
They're armed with power weapons and a great weapon on the Nightmaster. Massively tanky with their 4 wounds and minus 1 damage. And they've got scary enough close combat power to be able to deal with a whole bunch of enemy threats. Particularly flexing in 2 lethal hits and maybe extra AP in the right doctrine. Wouldn't be too surprised if some of those might be rapid ingressing. Seems like it could be a nice way to deliver them to melee reliably. Then beyond those 4 enormous melee punches and the big eradicator shot, there's a whole bunch of good objective support. A unit of three Ravenwing Black Knights with some Plasma Talons, a unit that can move very fast and still be quite dangerous and still contest objectives and things. Two sets of Jump Intercessors, some of the better secondary doers, and can still be good threats to enemy lighter units out there. And two units of five Scouts, a fairly common sight in most Space Marine army lists, screening out the midfield and redeploying. I must admit it's a lot nicer to see the Dark Angels actually making use of their scary melee elite units, a lot better than when it was just Azrael, Ironstorm and the Dark Shroud. Next up, we've got a disturbingly low model count Necron Hypercrypt Legion list. This one by Rob Gonzalez, using it to take first at Salt Lake Open, a 99 player event. This one basically just seems to be going for absolute overwhelm on the big scary damage dealer units, and then just taking incredibly minimal objective support. But also objective support that you might not be able to catch up with all that easily. It's three hex mark destroyers and one unit of death marks. Lone operatives can't be shot at long range, so there's a lot of control for putting them places where the opponent just can't damage them at all. And the hyperphasing can keep them bouncing around the board, hiding on primaries, or doing secondary objectives. Basically every other model beyond that though is just incredibly scary. There's no less than three doomsday arcs to blast enemy tanks into tiny little pieces from across the board. Pretty good damage output on these, and they can contribute to enemy hordes as well with all their gas flares. Unless it's needed for secondary objectives, I guess you could even think about deep striking one with cosmic precision if you really wanted a key line of sight. But even if they were just either hovering in the backfield, if they could get shot, or warping off the board and then turning up on the flanks once more, they'd still have lots of targets. Then the rest of the list is incredibly intimidating Catan spam. Very nasty units with just enormous amounts of defence. They've all got good enough damage output in their own ways as well. The Nightbring is there to be able to take down enemy heavy hitters. Though I guess you do have the Doomsday Arcs on hand to deal with the very toughest stuff. The other three are far better against Elite Infantry. The Deceiver for his redeploys. He does have okay damage against Terminators and things with his fists. And then two Transcendent Katarn that get the Deep Strike keyword. So they could be warped up right to the front of the army if it made sense to to deal a whole bunch of lightning attacks and threatened charges early on. I've just got a lot more flexibility as to where they go than the other ones. Lots of armies will find taking down even one Katarn a pretty big effort. And realistically, I don't think most armies will be winning the direct damage and defense sort of game against these guys. But at least at top levels of play, it certainly doesn't mean it's necessarily an automatic win army or anything like that. There's very little objective control in the list in particular. You'd have to make sure that the opponent didn't get up to an insurmountable lead on primaries and use all of those damage dealers to the absolute maximum as soon as possible. So the opponent doesn't just have enough units hiding out of line of sight to keep on stepping up and denying the Necron scoring any points or have enough strength in one area of the battlefield. Still certainly looks ridiculously nasty to fight though with seven enormous threats on the board that are going to take big chunks out of literally anything that they turn their eyes on. None of them are easy to kill and their secondary objective units are likely to be able to stay very safe when they need to. Next up we've got some Dark Eldar, and this one's a Drukhari Sky Splinter Assault Formation by a Wyatt Harris, who used this army list to take first at Palm Springs Open 3, going 6 games undefeated at an 160 player or so tournament. Drukhari again are one of the very strongest armies in 40k right now, still one of the slightly lesser played armies on the competitive scene, but people playing them do seem to be getting some pretty great results on average, both in terms of win rate and actual event tournament wins. Drukhari get their pain tokens for the reroll hits and maybe extra AP and melee as well, and they tend to use the Sky Splinter formation for the one with all the good transport things, particularly Lance keyword on getting out of transports for Incubi or Witches and that very long charge that you can pull off by moving a transport, disembarking a unit, and still charging. Very scary when the opponent knows that they just can't keep their good stuff out of range of your raiders. For the big melee punch to do that sort of thing with, there's two Archons leading a unit of 10 Incubi and a unit of 5 Incubi, and Lilith Hesperax leading a unit of Witches. It looks like the big unit of Incubi would go with the Archon with the Nightmare Shroud to deny Overwatch, they'd go in one raider, Lilith and Witches would go in another, and the last Incubi unit would go in one of the Venoms, and all of those are going to be very nasty at taking out one big threat, particularly for the Archons and Incubi supported with pain tokens for massive rerolls. Otherwise, there's a scouting Beastmaster to move into the mid-board and do annoying things and secondary objectives turn one. 
Two sets of Kabbalite warriors, likely going to be split in half in the Venoms and swoop around, pulling sticky objectives on things. You could have one of the half squads for the home field, and they still have a fair bit of dark light fire between them. Two units of five Mandrakes for some infiltrating screening, plus fading away to do objectives. Three units of five Scourges, so going very heavy on them with their Dark Lancers. They get to move, shoot, move, so have anti-tank fire that will fade away behind the ruins afterwards, and can still move very, very quickly when they need to do secondary objectives or important things late game. And a single Kronos Parasite engine to generate some pain token goodness, plus being an unusually tanky unit that's still what a bit of threat in its own right. Finally, perhaps the most interesting picks are a single Lonely Succubus and the Master Homunculus Urian Rakath, Looks like they're just meant to be minimum investment units that run solo to do secondary objectives or screening and things. The Succubus is pretty cheap and fairly fast, and Urian's annoyingly tanky for a character, and also has his stand up on death special rule, which means that he could be an annoying presence if he managed to get one part of the board, the opponent might not be able to just put him down reliably. I would have to dedicate more than one turn to do so, and he does have a bit of anti-infantry melee damage as well. Overall, loads of good stuff that makes the Drukhari very strong. Lances that all keep up the anti-tank fire and you can't really get to grips with. Three enormous melee punch units that could be well supported with pain tokens. Lots of objective scoring things between the Cabalites and Mandrakes. Plus those very cheap lonely characters and a scouting Beastmaster. The Warlord Archon can cause a lot of disruption to command points and stratagems as well if he gets into the middle of the force with that plus one command point debuff. Next up, we've got some glorious Astra Militarum. This one's an army list by Nick Jagiello, who used it to take first at an event called TGX, going 6 wins undefeated against an almost 100 player tournament. This one definitely feels a bit different to plenty of Imperial Guard lists out there. There are some staples like Lord Solar and a tank commander with a Demolisher Cannon, plus lots of Borgrin to hold the front lines. One of the most interesting things though are the big use of Chimeras with 4 of those on the field. Two with paired heavy flamers and two with paired heavy bolters. It looks like there's some ogrins running around in them as well. I guess making good use of their firing deck with their ripper guns and threatening a bit of melee if they need to. In command of the army there's Lord Solar Leontus. Everyone's favourite basically auto include source of command points, godly orders, redeploys and a little bit of melee. He doesn't have any infantry squads to attach to so I guess he'd either be going with the rough riders or just staying completely solo. I think it's pretty reasonable to run him solo if you hide him towards the back of the army though it would depend on the opponent not having indirect to fire over and shoot him. He'd be able to order a few interesting targets if needed to, like the Lehman Rosses and the Tank Commander. Next up, there's lots of Tempestus Scions, a Tempestus Command Squad with maximal special weapons, leading a big unit of 10 Scions with 2 Plasma Guns and 2 Melter Guns. There's lots of big rerolls for them there, and now they get lethal hits against things that aren't monster vehicles, the Hotshot Volley Guns are a lot more threatening as well. Plus they could pick up some extra AP from Fields of Fire or the Lehman Ross Exterminators if they need it. Talking of which, there's a Tank Commander with Demolisher Cannon, Morty Melters, Laz Cannon, and he's leading 2 Lehman Ross Exterminators. They're the ones with the Twin Auto Cannons that do put out some fairly good firepower, and then also debuff enemy units for an extra AP, potentially helping each other out, or other units like the Scions or the Chimeras. For a guard list, there's perhaps a disturbing amount of melee, Two big squads of ten Attila and Rough Riders, each really cheap now at just 120 points and all taking maximal hunting lances. On the charge they can easily warm round things like battle tanks with the melter tip lances and a quite a general purpose melee unit. Their durability isn't even awful for the cheap cost that they are now at 12 points per model. They can be very fast with move 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 as well. There's a unit of six Borgrin with brute shields and mauls, always nice to be scrapping over midfield objectives and they make a lot of high AP and high damage firepower go away very nicely. And then there's four Chimeras, which I'm guessing are going to be transporting the other two smaller Borgrin units and the two units of three Ogrins. The Chimeras are just really effective units in their own right, very cheap and put out loads of shots for dealing with infantry. And I guess just a tiny bit more general purpose now they acquired lethal hits against tanks and vehicles. It is kind of fun to think of those Ripper Guns picking up lethal hits against them, firing from the top hatch if they wanted to as well. Then there's another two Tempestus Scion units, which I guess will mainly be dropping for secondaries and support, and then a Rapier Laser Destroyer battery. I guess not the worst choice for an extra 35 points if you had them left over. It does have some okay anti-tank damage. It could just be left on a home objective, or even just put in Strategic Reserve as an annoying secondary objective doer that's got a little bit more threat than you might expect. Overall, feels like a pretty interesting guard list. Lots of annoying, cheapish, and very tough skirmish threats in the midboard. Some genuinely good firepower in the backfield with those Lehman Rosses and the Tank Commander, and some very nice counter attack type units in the Attila and Roth Riders that can threaten melee against a lot of scary stuff, plus that dropping in Tempestus Command Squad. 
Finally, we've got a scary Black Templar army list. This one was one that I mentioned on the channel a few weeks back. The one that a lot of people paid attention to that won the World Team Championship Singles Tournament, the Warmaster Tournament. A crazy 460 player event that was mainly a prelude to the big teams tournament. So winning this one was perhaps a doubly impressive achievement that it was both so big and also basically being a huge gathering of the best players in the world. As it was a teams tournament that they were prepping for, there were lots of skew lists about and the one that won one was one of those, a Righteous Crusaders Black Templar force run by Olivier Weiss, whose team I believe went on to win the championship overall, and pretty notable in just being in a horrifically scary Black Templar's horde list, having a massive 115 models in black power armour on the board, or crusading along to win the game for the Emperor no doubt. The Righteous Crusaders can give them more 6 plus feel no pain for extra durability, and flex into various other good damage buffs, plus has some really nice tricky stratagems like having a chance to lock enemy units in melee, gain a bit of AP and do a bit of reactive movement to enemy shooting. In the army there's a slightly mad 5 units of 20 Primaris Crusaders, all with maximal power fists and taking chainsaws beyond that. Sheer volume attacks should be able to make a mess of most enemy infantry units, particularly with buffs going on. They've got the potential to scout without attached characters, get to re-roll charges and have a huge amount of objective control, so once one of those sets up on an objective, you struggle to be outscoring them. Strung out, they can also deny a huge amount of deep strike as well. You'd likely be struggling to have much presence in the home field with this. Beyond that, there's two units of five scouts to have even more board control in the midboard. Those armed with missiles, snipers, chainsword and knives. And then a whole bunch of characters. A combi lieutenant for doing lone operative things and being a tricky unit to catch up with, plus his damage buff. A Castellan with 10 houses bones for the 5 plus feel no pain for his unit. I guess he'd be working with High Marshal Helbrecht to make just one of those Crusader squads into a ridiculously powerful melee powerhouse. If you could manage to get a good chunk of the squad in, then there's a good chance they could wipe out the majority of things in the game. Then there's one squad with a regular chaplain for a plus one to wound, which makes those chain swords far better against tough stuff. And Chaplain Grimaldus, who can give his unit a 5 plus feel no pain for yet more toughness, that can flex out for other things like advance and charge when he needs to. Overall, a pretty terrifying force of Crusaders there, but one that would need a serious amount of time and discipline to be able to play this properly. There's a ton of models that need to be moved, and loads of dice that would need to be rolled with this. A lot of the damage just comes from crazy volumes of chain swords, so definitely could be important to make sure that all the dice are rolled and maximal damage is dealt when they contact the foe. In any case, I'll leave that there for the army list today. Just 7 examples of some of the very best armies in Warhammer 40k that people have managed to use to take down the very biggest events in the world. Let me know your thoughts and experiences with the factions, and look forward to hearing any other insights about the army list in question if you have them. Finally, I'll just cycle back to the video sponsor, which is Titan's Terrain. As I mentioned earlier, just talking through a few of the pros and cons of it, and the exact offerings that they have that might be of interest to some of you out there. As mentioned, it's basically a pop-up system of battlefield terrain. You have a system of 12 tiles to make a standard size 40k board. It all packs away in one of the boxes that you can see here. So the biggest selling points are that it's very easy to store and transport, so a bit easier to move about than some. And perhaps the other biggest advantages are that it's far cheaper than, say, a whole board of Games Workshop terrain, and kind of similar in price to offerings in MDF or 3D printed stuff bought from a third party. Plus it doesn't need any painting or assembly whatsoever, once you have it, it's ready to go immediately. Each type of terrain does come with its trade-offs though. The main disadvantages for fallout terrain are that it's a little bit less sturdy, given that it's made of essentially tough cardboard as opposed to plastic or MDF, and each piece needs to be designed so it can fold flat for storage easily. The grid layout can be a little bit less flexible than some as well, so maybe it wouldn't be quite as easy to directly replicate, say, tournament-style terrain if that's what you're looking for. They definitely can create some different battlefields with it, with rotating the tiles or setting them up quite differently. I feel like it might not be the worst idea in the world to maybe just supplement it with like say one or two extra ruins or line of sight blockers, just to cut down on the firing lanes a little bit. I feel like casually it's usable enough as is. They've got several sets on offer. This one's a sort of industrial sort of world offering called a Forgotten Furnace, £112 or $140 or €131. Euros. This one's got a bunch of bombed out industrial ruins, shelters and forges, and all seeming to be of a pretty heretical nature, given the glowing orange stars on this one. For a bit more of a classic ruin terrain sort of look, there's this shattered hive one here. Again, the same price for the 40k size board of 12 tiles. This one's a little bit more of your traditional blasted ruins and things, plus a few more boxy style ruins. And otherwise, here's an overgrown capital set. A bit more greenery on this one and less of a sort of city hellscape 
a more sort of a ruined town could be a bit more appropriate for a set that's working both for sort of grim, dark, or fantasy type settings. I feel like this one wouldn't be out of place for either. Finally, they've got a few expansion centerpiece style sets. These ones are where you basically put two different tiles together to make one bigger building. There's a cathedral square that also has a ruined reliquary one, depending on the way that you want it dressed up on, either for the cityscape or the more verdant city ruins, and an infernal spire for the heretical furnace type one. That's a great big building centerpiece. In any case, a big thank you to them for sponsoring the video, and you'll find them linked down in the video description if any of those do seem interesting or useful to you. In any case, that's about it for this one. Feel free to subscribe to All Specs Tactics if you'd like to see more like this. I'll certainly keep the regular 40k videos coming with new ones just about every day. If you've been enjoying the videos and want to help support, feel free to check out the channel's Patreon page and everything down in the video description. You can see certain videos early on that, and there's a few other rewards. Plus, there's a whole bunch of 40k discount retailers there as well. If you were ordering in at any 40k stuff and you wanted a discount versus games workshop, Buying through any of those helps to support the channel. In any case though, an absolutely massive thank you for listening, and I'll hope to see you guys next time.